What do we mean by meaning? What is the language of thought that kids build on when they learn a language and that we translate words back and forth uh, into and out of when we speak and understand? Well, one clue comes from figuring out how the, what the logic is of uh, which words we use to describe what kinds of situations. And I stumbled across this in trying to make sense of some quirks of English syntax. Why can you say, I threw him the ball, I gave him the present, uh, or I threw the ball to him or gave the present to him? There's something a little bit odd about saying, I, I uh, lowered him the, the box. Or why can we say, I uh, told him the story or I told the story to him? We say, I whispered the story to him, but not I whispered him the story. It sounds a little bit off if you're a, a native English speaker. How come you can say, I poured water into the glass, but not I poured the glass with water? Sounds, uh, it makes perfect sense what I poured the glass at with water would mean if you could say it, but it just doesn't sound like English. On the other hand, the verb fill goes the other way around. You can say I filled the glass with water, but not I filled water into the glass. Again, you can understand it. An immigrant might say that and they'd be perfectly understood, but it's just not what our ear tells us is natural English. It can't directly be any obvious part of meaning because in uh, all those cases, the meanings are kind of the same to make some content go into some container to transfer uh, an object. After drilling down to what the difference is and diving into the linguistics literature, I found that there are certain components of meaning that are critical in which verbs you can use in which circumstances. And it all depends not on what's happening in uh, front of your eyes, but on how you construe the situation. Uh, what you think is being changed in what way. So let's take the difference between uh, to fill and to pour. They seem like they're pretty close synonyms, but they actually pick out different parts of the uh, situation. To pour refers to the manner in which the water is caused to move, namely as a kind of a co coherent stream. It's the difference between, say, dripping and spraying and uh, uh, drizzling. It's all about the path the water takes. But pouring doesn't tell you anything about what happens uh, to the glass, whether it ends up full or empty or the water ends up on the ground. It's a verb of change of position, a verb of manner of motion. Now fill, even though at first it seems very similar, turns out to have a, a different semantics. Fill refers to causing to become full. You can fill a glass in any of a number of ways. You could open a tap, you could pour from a pitcher, you can leave it outside during a rainstorm, you can put it underneath a leaky pipe. The water can get to it all kinds of ways as long as the glass ends up full. The difference is that pour means cause the water to go, fill means cause the glass to change state. So even though it's the same events, our brain construes it in different ways, kind of like those perceptual illusions in which a cube, for example, can flip between the uh, sense that you're looking at it uh, from the top or from, from the bottom. By looking at verbs that uh, pick out different aspects of the situation, uh, I tried to put together a kind of inventory of what are the elements of meaning that matter when you choose your words, like the difference between change state and uh, change position. And it turns out while English might have 100,000 words, it certainly doesn't have 100,000 different components of meaning. That over and over again, you find the same basic elements of meaning that are put together in different combinations in different words. There are things like move, cause, act, change state, uh, path, manner, uh, means, uh, time, and not time as measured by the clock, but time uh, kind of quantized into um, past, present, and future, roughly, with uh, variations from one language to another. Space is not reckoned in uh, meters and centimeters, but rather more qualitatively in terms of a place and uh, things that can be at the place, near the place, and that can move in different trajectories, uh, such as around, toward, uh, away from. That these couple of dozen uh, meaning components can uh, account for what aspects of meaning uh, languages care about, what we express most naturally, and probably uh, how we conceptualize uh, how 
objects in the world interact, our intuitive physics, our intuitive uh, engineering. I, I wrote a book called The Stuff of Thought, which began with some fairly uh, obscure questions in the syntax of English, like why you can say the water boiled and I boiled the water, but if you say uh, John came home, you can't say I came John home, and used those little quirks of English to try to delineate the inventory of thoughts that seem to uh, matter uh, to us. And a pleasing discovery was that a lot of the elements of, of meaning that seem to occur over and over again in many words and in many languages are what philosophers like Immanuel Kant uh, posited were the basic way of construing reality that is available to us. We can't help but see the world in terms of space and time and causality and agency, and it turns out that space and time and causality and agency are just the aspects of meaning that get packed into our verbs and that determine how we string the verbs, the words together.